Thank you very much, Ella. Um, maybe once we start with the, the three representatives of the region, they can make a short intro about uh, who they are. Uh, because I would only be able to tell half the truth, and I'm sure that they can make a better summary than I do. What I would like to do is to set the stage for a rich conversation by giving a short overview about the startup density and investment climate of different entrepreneurial hubs in Spain. So we will then dive into the unique challenges and opportunities cities like Valencia, Malaga and Zaragoza face when competing with major hubs like Barcelona and Madrid. So as far as startup density and growth uh, is concerned, according to recent data, it is estimated that around 20,000 startups are created in Spain each year. Now you may ask yourself, is this a lot or is this not so much? To put this number in perspective, let's look at the study done by Atomico, that's a well-known venture capital firm. And Atomico places the number of Spanish startups per million inhabitants at 170, uh, sorry, at 157, below the European average and very far from continental leader, which is Estonia, with 865 startups per million inhabitants. About half of these um, startups in Spain are based either in Barcelona or in Madrid including all of the country's unicorns. But founders based elsewhere in Spain want to challenge those cis dominance. And we have here three representatives. So the Basque country, Valencia, and the province of Malaga, and hopefully in the future, more and more also Saragossa are, are locations where startups are growing and attracting international investment despite skepticism from some Spanish VCs who still think success is only possible in the country's two biggest cities. Spanish startups raised 2.33 billion euros in 2023 across 382 deals, according to a report published by Bank Inter's Innovation Foundation. Yet less than a third of that amount, exactly 655 million euros, was invested in companies not in Barcelona and Madrid. I think it's clear that Barcelona and Madrid have higher densities of startups and more mature ecosystems. However, let's shed some light on how Valencia, Malaga and Zaragoza are emerging with significant year-on-year -year growth in startup formations. Maybe we can start with Tony. How has the startup ecosystem involved in your city in Valencia over the past few years? And what are some success stories or notable achievements of startups in your city? Well, thank you always for giving me the time to present to you guys what we're doing here in Valencia. We, we have the luck of having one of the wealthiest men here in Valencia willing to share his fortune with all of us here with the city of Valencia and more precisely for the startup ecosystem here in Valencia. He is Juan Roch. He is the one of the, well, the third wealthiest man here in Spain because he's the owner of a supermarket company called Mercadona. And one of his, I would say, hobbies is creating companies and helping companies create more jobs and there so creating more wealth. And he has created here in Valencia a hub called Marina de Empresas, which is formed by a business school an accelerator and investment vehicle, which is where I work on. Right now, for you guys to know, this was founded in around 2013, and now it's like 11 uh, years later. We are right now the third, uh, yeah, third incubator in Europe, the third biggest incubator in Europe, which means that we've been growing super, super fast in the last 10 years, because 10 years ago here in Valencia, we had nothing. And when I mean nothing is we didn't have like a public place where startups could meet. We didn't have co-working offices. And, and in a matter of 10 years, we created a hub where right now here in the Marina Bay, we're not alone. We share the Marina Bay with another incubator called Insomnia. We have also a, a other co-working spaces where we are having here venture capital funds coming in, other startups. And now we're just finally building one right, right next to us, which is going to host around 500 new seats for startups. And for us, this is also a really good news. We've, had, we've acquired with a public concession 
the building that we had next to Lanzadera. So right uh, in the couple of years, we will pass from having right now 300 startups, that's what we are hosting right now in our buildings, to around 500 startups per six month programs. That's what, what we're hosting. And the good thing about us is that what we do here is all focused on creating wealth and making people create that, make the dreams come true and create companies that they can grow financially well and have more more jobs created and the thing is that the good thing what we do here is completely free we don't have any kind of equity from the companies and what we're doing we're doing this just to help promote the city of valencia but in general all spain because we have companies coming from all around spain here for a six-month program so we can help them grow and give them all the opportunities that we have so to give you an example of companies that have passed through here we don't have the, those so-called unicorns because we are more of what we call the camel startups meaning that startups are financially mm -hmm. well and they don't they don't rely on super quick and super large um, increase in sales and capex intensive and so what we're looking at is for companies that are focused on creating EBITDA and creating sustainable companies that also look for investment but in a more i will say well well-made manner and um, a couple of examples for that we have for example a, a company that you may know it's called Cody games it's a video game company that right now it's making per year a revenue well a, a revenue of around 40 to 50 million euros with a profit of around 20 million euros which is not that bad if you turn into turn that there are 80 people in their team and when they started here in lanzadera there were only two the two founders so that's a good example for example you may know the example of tractors which when they were here in Lanzada, there were just 10 people. And I don't know how many are right now, but I mean, I think there are big, big, big team that are doing all things all around you with all their idea of the tracking and track, tracks and everything. But the good thing about us is that right now in numbers, because we got the numbers a few weeks ago, 85% of the 1,500 startups that have passed through Lanzadera are still alive, which for us, it's one of the biggest, I would say, goals that we can acquire. And the good thing is all of them have passed from at least having one or two people in the team to at least 10 or 20 or 30 people. So that's what we're looking for here in, in Valencia, to create more jobs and for so create more wealth. Tony, do you, do you think the research institutions and universities also play a role or it was more like the leadership of Lanzadera? I mean, we, what we do is, we, as, as we are 100% private, private initiative, we don't have those protocols, we don't have, we, we, what we do here, what we say here is, we rather say sorry than no, uh, that not doing it, so mm -hmm. things that universities are not capable of doing so, but what we do is we work with them hand in hand, for example, in our business school that we have here, both the degrees that we offer, which is a business focus on entrepreneurship and an engineering focus with also entrepreneurial background, they are all hand to hand with the university of valencia so what we do is we give them like a full official certification of the university but we are more focused on helping entrepreneurs like whenever they finish their career here in valencia or all in spain we are we are they, they tell us that we have to do like a final uh, essay or a tfg which is called a uh, final degree exam uh, work and here in, in edem what they do is that they can make a startup and that counts them as a final project for, for doing so. And the thing is that for a student has been finished college here, they get direct access. Urs was talking about the amount of startups that they are making here in Spain every year. We are only giving like entrance to around 200 to 300 startups every year, new ones. And we get around 1,500 applications per batch. And we do two batches per year, one in March and one in September. So the good thing about here is that we are trying to get the best of the best of the best to help them grow as quickly as we can, basically. And you go all sectors? Yeah, we do everything. We, we say we do not only uh, accelerate startups, that we accelerate companies. We have from pizza stores to, I don't know, pet store or pet, pet tech startups, up to deep tech, health tech, prop tech, insure tech, fintech, edtech. The only things that we do not accelerate are companies that may damage the image of our president, meaning that we do not accelerate companies of the sector of gambling, pornography, sex, arms, drugs. We say here, rock and roll, we do, because that's music and that's, that's nice. But apart from that, anything that can damage the image, we do it. And we don't care because we are we have 
all the experts that we need. And if we don't know anything, something about the sector, we try to find those people in charge. And are there any initiatives in Valencia that can like attracting uh, international investors or startups? Well, we do. We are now focused also on bringing a lot of international investors to Marina because the good thing is that we do not charge. It's commission free and we do not have any kind of fee. And what we're trying to do is to help them gain access to our ecosystem. But also here, for example, in Valencia, we also have Big Ban, which is a investors association yeah. that's also trying mm -hmm. to but it's more focused on the on the spanish ecosystem for but for international uh, investors it's a really good way of getting inside the ecosystem and getting to know other investors that are investing here in south because the good thing about the i would say the spanish uh, investor ecosystem is that there's not like an actual competitiveness but more of a collaborative way of doing whenever mm -hmm. we are seeing a startup and um, we see something that can be interesting for us uh, here in our in our case from angels what we do is we try also to present it to other investors that may suit the same opportunity and then it may be interesting for them we're not a kind of investor that just do, do our own investment analysis you know we also try to share with all the investors and as i've said we had we have around 300 startups every year here in antadera i cannot invest in all of them so what we do is we try to share with the investors all of the good opportunities and also be more picky in terms of I know what Urs like, I know what Sergio likes, so I, I try to just give them the ones that I know that they're going to really like, basically. We are right now 1,500 startups that have a program. We are more than 900 investors in our network. We are right now, I think we are 200 corporates that are also working in Lanzadera, also with startups, and around 2,000 students have passed through class, our classes in we started in 2013 so yeah yeah we're beginning building a new a really good community and the good thing about valencia in comparison with madrid and barcelona is that if all i would say 90 percent of the valencian startup ecosystem it's located in one area which is the marina bay so in a 10 minute walk from side to side you can see 90 percent of the ecosystem whilst if you go to barcelona or madrid you have to pay a lot of taxes to get to know every single character, startups or investors. And that's a really nice point because we're located in the beach. So we also have really nice views. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times. Um, do you think it's like a Valencia is somehow leveraging uh, like this community sense or its geographical location somehow to differentiate itself from other cities in Spain, for example? Yeah. I mean, we were, I think, chosen as one of the best cities to live on, I don't know, for, well, like Forbes or whoever. But the good thing is that the cost of living that we have here and also in Zaragoza is much more better than the one that they had in Barcelona and Madrid, at least for now, until more more people come here and we will have to grow. But for now, it's super, super fine. And for entrepreneurs, it's really nice because they can have a really nice house for the same price that they will pay for a room in Madrid or Barcelona. So for them, it's also the quality of life. But also for investors, I mean, we have 365 days per year sun. Right now, it's like 25, 26 degrees here. It's super, super hot. People are in the beach right now. I mean, it's super nice weather, super nice food. If you are a food lover, I mean, if you haven't tried paella, yeah, you have to do so. Although in, in Zaragoza, they really also have really nice food. I, I've always go every time I go there, they are super, super nice with us in that sense too. And the city itself is trying to promote and bring a lot of foreign people to try and live here in Valencia because right now with the old remote working and everything, many, many foreigners are trying to come to Valencia to work from either the city itself or the outer towns that we have in the marine in the, in the, in the coast bay, which are also really, really nice. That's great. I, I could ask like 20 questions, but maybe Urs has a plan to know. Let's talk yeah, a, let's... a little bit about other cities also. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very much, Tony, for sharing so so much good things about Valencia. Um, I'm already thinking of uh, buying a, a second apartment there. <laughs> Before um... it gets too, too expensive, no? <laughs> well, you can go to a town nearby, it's half the price. And you're up in a beach town like Altea or Javier or one of those. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's let's move on to Sergio. Uh, what are some of the main challenges that startups face in your city in Zaragoza, and and how are they being addressed? Especially as you said at the beginning, by you that you have been the driving force during the last two years of putting Zaragoza on the map. Well, first of all, it's really complicated 
to present something after Tony's explanation because it's like <laughs> you, you see the mirror in what you look at and then you have to explain that Zaragoza is also a really good city but it's, it's almost impossible because Valencia is performing pretty very well and Lanzadera as Tony explained is wow is it for us is the place to be is the place to go being honest but um, I, I'm going to explain a little bit of my experience and how I came back to Zaragoza and then why everything started. I live abroad so many years and after that I live in Barcelona for six years. I learned about the ecosystem and how it works there. And, and also because I'm a little, little freak about the entrepreneurship and all the innovation ecosystems, I run a lot. And all the ecosystems are more or less the same. Innovation is in the middle, and there are like three main actors. One is talent, Adam, our internist way. Angels is the other, is is uh, VCs or is money investors, and the other one is startups, is companies. And you must replicate it if you want to to grow it. So when I came back to Zaragoza, I said, okay, I learned it in Barcelona. There were a lot of things, a lot of startups. What is going on in Zaragoza? And I discovered there was few things. So there were only two options. The first one was, okay, let's, <laughs> let's get away. And the other one was, okay, we lead it. So instead of leaving, we decided to lead. Uh, and then we started from being a, a venture builder. Uh, uh, we in several were, I were a venture builder, but the problem we had is, is that equity is not cast. So we are condemned to death if we haven't cast to pass the year. So we moved to corporate venture building, and that's the way we've been growing since then. And in in the meantime, we started the Zaragoza Startup Fest that you yours uh, come to to visit us and to join and you join it and you supported us from zero. And the first edition. 300 people came the second one this year 400 this year 500 so you are growing uh, the main challenge is that you ask of course, uh, we are growing it we are building it from zero as i said before there were few incubators and also the accelerated programs were not as good as they must be uh, there is not an investor club working the talent is not uh, conscious about going to to start a, their own business so we've been trying to put all the pieces in order and trying to change as a as a little bit a uh, small company that we are you know we are not the the, the third wealthiest people in spain but we're, we're trying step by step uh, changing it and what is the main problem that we face that also companies are not concerned a lot that innovate startups are the driver of the innovation and but i must say that in the last three years that we have been working in Zaragoza and in aragon it has changed a lot and they've been listening to us a few a few a few a few and now they have valencia mm, valencia is the is the city that is quite similar to zaragoza we, we Thing that we can not copy but learn and reply some things that have worked there and try to put it in in, in our city for instance doing hubs like Tony explained before so this is more or less the explanation this is more or less what we've been doing and if you want to continue with uh, some questions I, I will ask for sure yeah, I would like to know how does uh, how do you collaborate with neighboring regions or cities to strengthen uh, your position in the in the startup ecosystem? Well, uh, I I always say that it's mandatory to look for the neighbors and and learn what they are doing, what is working and what is not. Otherwise, you will only focus on your on what you are doing and then you you lose perspective i visited valencia a lot of times i try to go to barcelona at least one time well three two or three times per year and also madrid and we try to to collaborate with the stakeholders investors uh, other uh, agents from the ecosystem and we'll 
we try to bring all of you to Zaragoza at least one once per year in at Zaragoza Santa Fe, that is in October, and all of you are are more than welcome to join us. And in these gatherings, uh, we try to split in the three pillars as I said before: investor in, uh, investments, uh, in the startups, and 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 talent. And we try to to put together with the agents in in Zaragoza. For instance, Tony and, I, and Angels is really close to us because we also have and YouTube YouTubers because we also have an investor club. So the best way is to share deal flow. This is one one example. We also are working with uh, another accelerators from Madrid and from Malaga to reply the model and how they are they working and try to explain to our local um, accelerator programs and and it for, for us is the key to learn and reply what are uh, some governmental support i remember last time i was there at the startup fest uh, you were able to get some people from the local government to join uh, the startup fest as well what is on the roadmap? What what help or what support can you get from these people to replicate, as you said, other uh, ecosystems where they have uh, many more startups and and many more investors supporting them? Mm -hmm. Well, Aragon uh, decided like one year ago to change from forty years ago. It was only an industrial region from Spain. 20 years ago, it changed to be a, a logistic region. And almost all of us can can say that Zaragoza is in the middle of the north. And you can move to Valencia in less than three hours, to Bilbao in less than three hours, to Barcelona or Madrid in an hour 15 by the train. So you can connect with more or less 70% of, of, of Spain's main cities in less than three hours, and this is amazing. And last year, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they landed in Zaragoza and they they look at Zaragoza as a really good place to build data centers. So this is an opportunity for, for us to change from industrial and the logistics to technology. And innovation is the, is the driver of this technology. So there is a great opportunity to to develop the innovation to all the companies. Building a spaces, joining with mobility, that is one of the main, of the main pieces in, in Zaragoza, and so on. And government has put a strong effort um, they wanting that uh, all these companies make investments, not only in the data centers, but also in the region. They have developed a plan for the next three or four years to be like Valencia, uh, city of arts and technology, this, something, something similar is, is is being cooked in Zaragoza in this time. I, I don't know exactly what are they doing, but they they require us an MVP at the at the place that you leave the Zaragoza Santa Fe. It has changed from arts and technology building to entrepreneur, innovation and technology building, and we Zebra will be there. So this is the, the the movement that the government is is changing. They also want to want to build um, a VC, a public VC, and also a crowdfunding from public crowdfunding. They want to change all the accelerator programs. They are involving young people into a STEAM. So I think they are putting a lot of ingredients, and in the next three or four years, we will we'll see a great change in in our region. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's uh, quickly move over to Malaga. Uh, there we have Alex uh, representing Aonic. Uh, it's also a venture capital fund. Alex, uh, recently what I read in the news is that Malaga attracts more and more innovation hubs. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit more about you, about uh, what are the challenges that Malaga is facing, and, and how do you compete uh, with other cities, um, not only Barcelona, Madrid, but as you have heard, um, Valencia is, is really growing fast, and I'm sure it's just a number 
uh, scheme and the question of time until we will see the first unicorn in Malaga as well, uh, in uh, Valencia as well. And I think Malaga is, uh, how can I say that, increasing the pace to keep up with, with Valencia and others. Can you share some of uh, your thoughts, please? Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, if you thought it was difficult, ask a Tony. It's twice as difficult now for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about myself and then I'll, I'll sort of answer the question on the perspective of, of Malaga. So, you can call me Alex, please. Um, many years ago, I was a physicist. Uh, I then went into the investment world where I dealt with uh, researching uh, companies uh, for investment, whether it was debt, whether it was equity. Uh, and I know Tom uh, for many years, and I assist and help in terms of hunting and, and searching and analyzing companies. Uh, and, and, and Tom, of course, works in Ionic, which is which is a VC fund. So Malaga is 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 clearly a very interesting city. We, we probably all have heard something happen about Malaga over the years. It has a very interesting history, uh, and it's it, and this history, which if I may have a minute, I will just revise because I think it's important. Uh, to understand how different components sort of join together. I think uh, Andrea was sort of touching on this by the question she was asking Tony. Um, so Malaga originally was this tourist location where people from all over Europe primarily, mainly from Northern Europe, uh, came. You had large Scandinavian communities, large British communities, uh, also German communities, and this led uh, for now over 50 years ago to infrastructure being built in the area. So originally transport infrastructure, roads, housing, and so forth. This was a very uh, rapid development which brought international people. And I think already from that time changed the culture around that area and the open-mindedness of the area compared to surrounding uh, surrounding cities. So that 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 was one factor. One factor that Malaga has also done exceptionally well, I think, uh, is the, the pillar of government. Okay, so even if we go back to the example of Silicon Valley, uh, I, I think the reality of Silicon Valley is that originally the government set up a very large airfield and started investing in the beginning of the U.S. aerospace industry in that area, which brought scientists and engineers to the area, uh, which allowed the universities to grow and flourish, which led to the Stanford and the Caltech and, and, and the Berkeleys and so forth to, to grow. So in Malaga, that pillar is very strong. And, uh, and they have supported startups, whether it's with supporting events, accelerators, incubators, also creating the Malaga Tech Park, which created a lot of big companies to come to the area, the Oracles, the Microsoft, more recently, the Google Cybersecurity Division. So we're talking about top tier technology companies, which bring top tier employees, which allow these people to integrate into the local environment. And, and, and they become members of society. They transmit their views, their opinions, their knowledge. It creates a very positive cycle, yeah? uh, a self-fulfilling cycle in some way, which has benefited Malaga very well. So you have this pillar of very international, this pillar of a government which has brought in large companies and supporting startups. And this sort of has mixed together and has allowed newer companies to be born, startup companies, and you've already had a number of successful sales. So you may have heard of FreePick, Virus Total, Medac. And what does that create? Well, that's the next phase, isn't it? Because then that money, a lot of it gets recycled back into the startup community, into new investments and new VCs. Uh, and so it creates the cycle and allows it to scale where success breeds scale. You reach a critical mass, and then you have the university. So Malaga has with an element of luck and by an element of design, I think mix these elements quite well to create the environment they have today. I don't know if I've answered your question, basically. I mean, that's the historical perspective. You, you definitely did. Um, what I would love to know to understand is what factors do you think have contributed to this growth? Uh, apart from what you just mentioned about the attractiveness that uh, Malaga has for for uh, entrepreneurs, I mean, I think it's a Malaga 
type answer, but you could also say it's a Spain type answer. I, as a foreigner, I think I would say that, which is that Spain obviously has a very attractive quality of life. Uh, and it has always attracted people, say, from Northern Europe or even from the States, you know. So this this factor, which in Malaga, for example, you have it because you have beaches, you also you can ski pretty close in Granada. You've got cities like Seville, like Granada, like Cordoba. Uh, you have a very high quality of life. You combine that with what Tony said earlier about the weather, about the food, about the cost of living. It's a very attractive quality of life. And if you add to that an entrepreneur that's looking to start a business. Uh, where maybe if I compare the employee, the cost of an employee in America or the cost of an employee in, in the south of Spain, it's also very attractive. And you have very educated people. There are a lot of universities in Andalusia and Malaga, etc. So it's a very attractive package that's being offered. The pillar that sometimes doesn't make half the world come to Spain is, is, is the political pillar, perhaps, because people worry about what's the physical situation, uh, you know, how easy is it to hire people? Uh, you know, these these more uh, bureaucratic issues. Um, but if you find an ecosystem where you have a local government that's very positive and you have the normal things that you can get with the quality of life here, then you get a turbo charge. And, and I think they played that very well. Alex, uh, um, I have a question. Uh, of course, it's difficult to compete with Malaga. If you're in Madrid or Saragossa, increase on myself and say you, because of course, it's a beautiful place to live, beaches, it's attractive, no? From this uh, perspective of uh, being like a vacation almost type of city, no? How do you compare Malaga with, for example, Barcelona and Valencia in terms of attractiveness for startups and investors? Well, I have to put a caveat that I, I've not been in Valencia or Barcelona a lot. I mean, I've obviously been there, but I, I maybe don't know the depths of it as well as I do Malaga. But I think one lucky advantage that Malaga may have is that it has been a tourist attraction for so long. So it has a very deep international community. So, for example, mm -hmm. it has a lot of international schools. Right. Mm -hmm. If you look at the top 100 international schools in Spain, you'll find a lot of them are in Andalusia, a lot of them are near Malaga. Right. Mm -hmm. That is that is a non-trivial issue for someone in his mid to late 30s who may be coming from America or from Germany or from England and has kids. So these little trivial intangible factors that have come through decades of development uh, are, are, are intangibles that supports that supports Malaga. Uh, whilst Madrid and Barcelona have this as well, they don't have it at the same cost structure. Mm hmm. Interesting. I, I think I think that's an important an important element, yeah. And that's only been accelerated with the remote working, you know. So so you know it's a great place to come for for the factors mentioned if you want to be a remote worker. But also, I would say yeah. that it's the Malaga Tech Park and the digital hub they they played like a key role uh, as a initiative for attracting the startups in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Sure. You, whenever I go to an event in Malaga, there's always some interested employee from Google, from Oracle, that's like, you know, I've been here five years, I'm looking to start a startup. That's exactly what the region needs, yeah? They need someone with a big brain, with international experience, that is willing to take the risk and has an ecosystem that makes him feel comfortable, him or her, to feel comfortable in taking that risk. And, and, and I, I see that a lot. I see that a lot. And, uh, and in Andalusia, uh, Malaga is, is pioneering in that approach. You know, it, it really, you think it's a pleasure actually to deal with the local government. For example, um, I, when I, and I speak to Tom, you know, and he wants to arrange an event and he'll give me a comparison of X, Y, and Z. He says, it's always a pleasure to try and organize it in Malaga. Everything's just easier. Nice. These little things, little intangibles make a difference and add up all the time, right? Sometimes it's like, oh, what's the big difference? But usually it's just a lot of little things that just add up over time. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. So you you think there's a competitive edge, sort of, no, for the startups regarding well, and what, maybe also connectivity to international players, also because so many foreigners, no. I like two uh, two point examples that I saw. That the, the other month I was made aware that a Swedish gaming company. 
uh, totally irrelevant and and but it was you know it's it's a, it's a tech based business let's say because it's purely online has 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 suddenly moved the website designing team to Malaga. I mean, I, I just that blew my mind away. Huh. It could have gone anywhere in the world, and they chose Malaga. So when you see an example like that, it must mean some critical mass has been reached. You know? I think this uh, digital nomad uh, thing yeah, may exactly. be helping a lot also. Yeah. No, they start us because they can just relocate the resource, and they are like uh, working yeah. for companies outside and just. Yeah. So you, but I always like yeah. to differentiate, you know, because you got digital nomads. Now, digital nomads can come from a lot of different age ranges and a lot of different circumstances, but mm -hmm. a lot of them don't have a family mm -hmm. or an extended family, right? But then you have the other pillar I was mentioning about schools, which means that you, which makes it easier for you to be a nomad in Malaga because you feel more comfortable that your kids have uh, have a lot of international schools. In other in other cities, maybe that's a little bit more difficult, you know. Uh, I've met I've met a lot of Americans, for example, that say, "Yeah, no, I came here because of the school. You know, maybe it was a Soto Grande school, or maybe it was this school, maybe it was that school," and uh, and and that brings them that brings them in. You know, the other factor just is it, a bit more of a joke, really, but it caught my attention. It came in my LinkedIn feed yesterday. Uh, there was there was this Norwegian person who had made a post said, um, "Don't." He made a song on a piano and it said, "Don't come to Norway." I don't know if anyone saw this. Uh, it was, it was no. a big hit on, on LinkedIn uh, yesterday evening, and the poor guy, he had started a business, and and uh, and now Norway, the Nor Norwegian government, has, I think, and, and don't quote me on this, but it's something like this, I think they're now imposing a 37% tax if you leave Norway on the valuation of your company. So whether there's a gain that's realized, unrealized, liquid, not liquid, in profit, out of profit, so it, it creates this barrier, and this poor guy was so upset. He actually sang a song, very nice song, actually called "Don't Come to Norway." So it just shows how important the pillar of government is. True. Sometimes it doesn't help. Sometimes it uh, even obstructs it, right? <laughs> even create more yeah, challenges. Maybe, maybe they don't mean to, right? I mean, there's always a law on intended consequences, but uh, I, I'm not going to say if anyone does it bad or I'm just saying that Malaga in this case seems to have got it really good. And uh, and it's, it's it's always it's always very, very good when that happens, you know, because uh, it's it's it can be a very good advantage. It's it's not a the com typical competitive advantage you learn in an economics class, but it's a very real advantage. But Andalusia in general is very agricultural, uh, tourism, no focus. It. What other industries do you think these startups are like uh, focusing when uh, in Malaga? Yeah, I mean, Malaga in There's particular, I think. Industries? Yeah, uh, I think in Malaga, when I walk, when you ever walk down the street in Malaga, I, I'm always surprised how many adverts there are just on the street for like, courses to learn how to program uh, about technology about you know becoming tech savvy and feeling comfortable with technology so it's a city which has embraced the concept of just being digital of being tech savvy and i think that's that's another advantage of the city i mean people there are not intimidated by technology uh, other cities that are relatively close to malaga have don't have that uh, that philosophy and and you have many means to learn very quickly. So, you know, I've seen a lot of ed tech businesses in the area, uh, but really, I think the core skill. And you say there's a whole range of industry. I don't want to focus on a particular industry. But what I think I see the key skill is that ability to embrace technology and be able to use technology. That that's what I'm seeing in Malaga. Yeah, because because once you have that as the foundation then you're not limited by the industry. Obviously, the, if you have an industry which is very strong in an area, uh, you're more likely to, to penetrate it and get scale quicker, you know, because it's just closer and there's more knowledge of that industry. So you mentioned tourism or agriculture or even aviation because you have a strong aviation uh, network in, in Andalusia. Uh, but that core knowledge that I see being built in, in Malaga, it, it's very beautiful how, they, how they're achieving that and how they're doing that. So I, I think that's their core skill, you know, that, that are not afraid of, of technology. So interesting. Let, let's quickly wrap up with two more questions for each of you and then open space also for some questions from the audience. 
I would like to know, based on your experience, uh, Tony, Sergio, and Alex, what would be your recommendation to other cities like the ones that you are living in um, to further enhance their attractiveness for startups and investors? Should we answer it in the same order as before? Maybe you first, Tony? Okay, I, I don't mind you can be well. Yeah, okay. I don't care. Okay, I, I will say it. But for us, we would like to have more one roaches. <laughs> more private initiatives <laughs> and more people with money willingly to help others that don't have that money and create more ecosystems like this. But we know that's really hard. So I would like to also like punch a little bit on the on the also the government that we have here and the and the downtown area to help us and have more public aids for the entrepreneurs. Right now here in Valencia, they're doing some investors are starting to to invest in what we call uh, co-living areas for entrepreneurs, because right now here, as we're building a really big ecosystem here in Valencia, in the Valencian Bay, a lot of investors are, are starting to build housing for those entrepreneurs. And we're trying to bring down the, the rent costs, because right now here in Valencia, as I told you before, that the cost of living is really good. People have, have noticed that, and it's coming up. So we're trying to keep it down for entrepreneurs, as, as we know. Many of them are not capable of Step, spend, spend a lot of time. I mean, keep in mind that 60% of the entrepreneurs that we have here in Lanzadera are from the Valencia community area, but 40% are from outside Valencia. And we have also foreigners coming from all around the world coming to Lanzadera, and they have to come here for at least six months. And we have people, I didn't tell you this before, but the average age of the entrepreneurs here in Lanzadera are between 35 and 40 years old. So may, may, mainly they're people with families and they leave behind their family for six months to come here for a six month program and they can extend it to one year and most of them do it. So we're, we're starting and we're looking for aids for them to stay here and not make them like a huge impact in their familiar situation and financial needs that they have, may have. So yeah, more Juan Roches and more public needs for housing and helping entrepreneurs to be here and create more ecosystem, more part. What about you guys? Well, Alex, I, I will continue. Uh, as I explained before, I think the key point is to balance the three main pillars. You must have investors and they have to be professionals. Otherwise, they will put money once and they will run as fast as they can. Therefore, you must join them and try to explain in a bootcamp or something similar, how is it working? And then everything will, will work much better, much, much pretty, pretty better, sorry. The second one is about talent. It is not only about incubators, it's about going to young people and to explain that they can uh, work with their creativity to build something different than uh, work in a company or work for the for the government they can build their own uh, startups or their own uh, companies from zero it's possible and there has to be a lot of effort there and the third one is about companies they must face uh, startups as a way to uh, to innovate and not like people that are uh, working in a in a garage, the, the inventing things, and it can work or not. This is this is something different. And linking with the camels that Tony explained before, I believe in this model of startups that uh, develop innovation and not uh, try to put something new in the market. And that's all. If I could say something to this new or to to other ecosystem, it will be this one: balance the ecosystem and put effort in the three lines. Okay. Alex, um, you know, I, I always uh, I always get worried when uh, when, when we generalize too much. So I'm always I'm always very cautious about that. But I'll use a, a, the metaphor of of economic growth. So you know, we see countries after the Second World War, uh, and a lot of countries that were in difficulties and that have done very well in the, in the last fifty years seem to have followed a similar model. So whether it's Germany, whether it's Japan, South Korea, whether it's China. Uh, so they have developed a template. And I do believe there is a template. 
uh, to creating an ecosystem uh, for startups. And, and, I, and I would simplify that there's probably five components. So the first component, I think, is you need to have government support because starting is the hardest thing. And starting means, you know, you ideally need to try and bring talent here. Yeah? And it's very hard to bring talent here when there's, let's go to an extreme, if there's no talent somewhere and suddenly you want to have talent, that's hard. So you need to have government support. They have the, the money, they have the capital, they have the links to try and create something like that. Okay, So you need to have, I think, the government on board to really reach uh, momentum, I think, at the start, yeah, to bring to bring the to help bring the scientists and engineers, uh, and you need to have the universities, you know, secondly, so that you have not only talented people or who maybe already have experience that are brought through government programs, but then you have the young people that will then make the next generation that will take the knowledge that's being brought into an area. You know, uh, I, I think that the third the third part is you need to have larger companies. You need to try and attract larger companies that also bring established people. Because once you have this mass, you start having infrastructure, you start getting a, a certain level of knowledge in an area. And then these are able to create people that might have startups, that might want to create startups. Now, here I have a caveat, yeah which is, you know, it, it's a bizarre little idea of mine, but I distinguish between startups that are infrastructure focused and startups that are application focused. You know, it's hard to develop, say, applications for electric vehicles in a town where there's no automation being developed because you don't have the infrastructure. So you're just building the application. And I think having the infrastructure close helps. You know, I think I think Andrea alluded to that indirectly with a question. So. Ideally, having both is very powerful. Uh, Silicon Valley initially made silicon chips, right? So there was deep knowledge on how to build silicon and use silicon, which now we just see more of the software side. But there's that deep hardware knowledge and the design knowledge as well, which allowed software to be built. So having that balance between infrastructure and application is ideal. And again, that usually requires government helping companies come in. You know? Uh, to sort of try and balance that, to, to make sure there are Hewlett Packards and, and 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 manufacturing, and then of course the the fifth point, which I think Sergio mentioned very well, was the financing. Yeah, you need you need money. Uh, you know, Tony also mentioned it through through the example of, of of what Mercadona is 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 able to fund into the community. But you you need you need either a VC industry or government support or an angel network uh, to bring money onto the table so that uh, people feel like yes, I can do a project that's financing to support me. So I think if, if you have to try and get those five elements, and usually when you see success in an area. I'd be surprised that you don't see those five elements.